So first, Diana Latse Davidova from Latvia. So currently she does some magic as a deal flow manager at an early stage VC fund Super Angel, whose portfolio includes such unicorns and darlings of the Baltic startup ecosystem as Bolt and Verif. And prior to that, Diana was also the investment director at Overkill Accelerator and VC Fund. She's also the brain of the Global Shapers Initiative here in Latvia. And birds are chirping that uh, today is her also last day at the Startup Association, Latvian Startup Association. Thank you. So let me take my place on this wonderful stage. And then I will introduce our speakers who are joining remotely, uh, but in spirits are of course here. And um, we have three of them. I will go uh, and introduce them in the uh, sequence of the geographical proximity, starting from those who are the furthest away. And the first we have uh, Dr. Thomas Kostka, Germany. Thomas' background is truly fascinating. He's been uh, on all sides of the barricades, so to say. So he has mastered the corporate world, working for more than 10 years at Hankel Group. He's also been the front runner of the scientific and R&D front, particularly chemistry and advanced materials. And he's been wearing the shoes of a startup as well, I've heard. And currently he is leading the corporate venture at Altana, which is a global leader, leader in true specialty chemicals. So a virtual round of applause and hello, hello, Thomas. And then we also hello. have, wonderful. And then we also have Paweł Bochniasz from Poland. Uh, he is the partner at uh, Value Tech Seed Fund, an early stage VC, VC fund focusing on innovations in energy and industrial manufacturing. Aside from that, Powell is a serial entrepreneur, investor, advisor, and expert in commercialization of new technologies and a guru of startup acceleration. Pavel is also very well familiar with the developmental work because he serves as a board member at the Foundation of the Technology Entrepreneurship and he chairs the MIT Enterprise Forum of Central and Eastern Europe. So Pavel, hello, nice for you to join us today. And uh, last but not the least, uh, somewhere here in this city, in, in, in Riga, we have uh, Ilona Gulchak, who is joining us also remotely. And Ilona is a finance expert uh, with more than 20 years of first-hand experience in the banking industry. She is a deputy chairperson of the supervisory board at Bolting International Bank. And, you know, of course, as, uh, like, you know, all the best people always wear many hats. She is also very heavily involved in commercialization of deep tech innovations. Ilona manages uh, investments and strategic partnerships at Commercialization Reactor, which is also a partner of the very deep tech atelier, which at the moment gives us this platform to, to be together. So, hello Ilona. So here we are. And um, it's a little bit weird setup for, for me, you know, a lot of excitement having some people here and then remotely, but uh, let's, let's hope we will manage that well. And maybe, you know, to uh, check that technology works properly. It always fails at some, at some moment, but, you know, fingers crossed. And in order to break the ice, I would like to run uh, maybe a warm-up round with you guys. You know, there is a, a book called um, We Have to Talk About Kevin. Not sure if you read it, but it's about a teenage boy who uh, one morning wakes up, takes some guns, goes to school and massacres half of uh, his fellow students. Uh, not to be negative, but I think uh, this year another book could be published. Let's talk about COVID, right? <laughs> and COVID is the official, um, I don't know, conversation opener of 2020 and uh, 2021. So guys, a quick check-in, how you've been doing um, in these challenging times, maybe some, some fun stories to share, some anecdotes. I would, I would love to hear something from you. Let's keep it positive uh, and, and short. So Thomas, can I start with you? Sure. 
So what, what happened last year was a very interesting year for me because I changed jobs. So in, in the summer, I started with Altana and I was working through basically all the investments in the portfolio. And I saw a line item in one of our startups that was called private chat charter. And I was like, Ooh, where did I, did I join here? <laughs> so I found the CEO of that Israeli startup company. And the story was directly related to COVID because they had a um, machine set up planned in, in Hungary, actually. And they couldn't fly out the team of six engineers to, to install that machine. So in, instead of waiting for regulations and shutdown, uh, they, they worked creatively around. And they basically hired for actually a, a price that's the equivalent of like two business class flights to the US, uh, <laughs> that private charter and flew the entire team, six or eight people in the end, uh, to Hungary with a commitment to stay there for at least six or eight weeks, weeks on a row to be then replaced. And nobody knew in advance when they would come back. Yeah, So it, it just showed the, the amazing commitment and also the creativity to, to just make ends meet in a startup environment. Thank you, Thomas. That's quite a struggle and a challenge, right? Ilona, how about you? How, how are you doing today? And yeah, I anything? Think, uh, very, very busy like everyone here. And uh, we were just discussing before we joined that uh, everyone is extremely busy with lots of things happening. Well, just to speak about what I have experienced during this uh, time uh, is that uh, I was able to see how my child uh, studies uh, and in parallel watching uh, some cartoons and still doing quite well in, in his uh, marks, uh, quitting, uh, doing, uh, uh, hitting very good scores. Uh, I also uh, was watching how my colleagues who refused to use any kind of technologies are now very much advanced in those technologies. And um, myself, I, I, I was really lucky to now uh, getting deliveries all the time for all of the foodstuffs. And I was extremely, <clears throat> it was extremely problematic for myself before that to go to the shop because I didn't have time. But now I, I have my planning skills uh, and I, I do manage my uh, uh, food del delivery. So lots of things, uh, positive, but of course negative, but maybe we, we can skip these negative things. Thank you, Ilona. I think uh, what I heard yesterday, you know, um, about this you know, te technologies and, uh, and us being able to plan our time using screens and so on. And uh, one word stuck to me, screenagers. So now we are all screenagers. There are no more teenagers. There are no more elderly people. We are all screenagers in these digital times. OK, thank you. Pavel, how have you been doing? Well, thank you. I've been doing quite well. I, I you know, I'm, I'm a little privileged because I live outside of uh, Warsaw in a very nice setting, you know, uh, in the middle of a forest. So that really proved very helpful uh, when pandemic hit and, you know, we could take walks uh, with my family here um, around the house. Um, on the business level, uh, you know, I think we've learned a couple of things about ourselves uh, and, you know, I would say on the positive side, I think we've, we've observed a lot of uh, creativity, right? And when I looked at my portfolio companies um, at Value Tech, uh, you know, I saw, you know, 3D printing company shifting to providing 3D printing services and, you know, printing protective equipment to medical staff. Um, I actually saw quite a lot of um, uh, growth uh, in a company that we invested in that, that does um, air quality uh, measurements. And suddenly, you know, we became interested in uh, more and more in what we are breathing in. Um, and so there was a huge surge in, uh, you know, air filtration, air quality monitoring equipment, and companies had to adapt to that. Uh, so we can be creative, you know, we also uh, saw a company in Poland that produced, um, you know, uh, systems for measuring temperature in, uh, for pig farmers. And now they totally pivoted <laughs> because there is more demand for measuring temperature in humans. So, you know, all of these th shifts have happened and they will be happening, you know, um, still. At the same time, one thing that I, I guess is a little bit, uh, you know, 
I don't know where, whether it's worrying or not, but I think it's a truth about uh, us as humans uh, that you know, when given a choice between uh, privacy and safety, uh, we tend to choose safety. Uh, and uh, you know, if you look at what happened in Korea, uh, where people basically uh, started giving out a, a lot of private data uh, to you know, health service providers, to public authorities, just to make sure that uh, we, we, we will know who we're meeting with, are we not uh, threatened by you know, being exposed to people who, who, have, uh, been, uh, who have contracted the virus. That I think is, is an interesting thing to see and uh, you know, we'll see how that evolves um, over time. Uh, is it something that will stay for good uh, with us or not? Okay, thank you so much, Pavel. Um, I will really come back on this uh, a bit later, so please hold your thoughts uh, and don't steal my question. Uh, I will give uh, the chance to uh, Diana to share how, how she's been doing. I mean, it's so exciting to see you without a mask <laughs> to start with, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Hello, everyone. It's really great to be here, actually. And today, actually, is a day that brings a lot of hope in me. I uh, purposefully chose to come here in person because I wanted to see how these hybrid events function. Last time I was here in Hans Esperons in Riga, um, a year ago when a tech conference tech chill took place here with hundreds and hundreds of people, COVID was still maybe... Um, not so daunting on us. We knew that it existed, but we didn't know what it will actually bring. It was a different world back then, and now we're sitting here, and it's, it's, it's quite crazy, to be honest. But the hope is that uh, today is the day that um, Latvian government is running the experiment uh, uh, vaccinations, and my social media feed has been full with people just queuing up, getting their vaccines, getting back to a hope of a normal life or getting back to normal. And I think this is actually great. We finally see some maybe light at the end of the tunnel. And after a crazy year like this, all we need as humans is just a ray of hope. And I think today brings us a bit of that, at least here in Riga in Latvia. So I'm very happy about it. Thank you, Diana. Actually, hope that will be one of the centerpieces of this, <laughs> of this discussion, as, as we will uncover later. So... Coming back to what also uh, some of, of you already touched upon, but Pavel also, you know, started uh, this very interesting line of thought. Um, you know, our, our topic, right, the fueling the technologies of tomorrow, just before we plunge into tomorrow, it's of course interesting to see where are we at the moment, what is the status quo. And um, the question for you guys from, from my side would be, what are the, those technologies which you see have been really accelerated recently and which perhaps were, you know, going into abyss, which have been becoming irrelevant? And uh, yes, as I mentioned, Pavel already started this line of thought, really talking about safety versus privacy and, you know, COVID-19 definitely triggered certain changes. So, so Pavel, would you like maybe to, to continue that? And then we also ask other, other guys to share their observations. Maybe something you see from the startups you work with, with, uh, with your portfolios and yeah, things like that in your immediate networks. What is dying and what is thriving? Okay, so um, it's, a, it's a good question and you know, I only have a partial picture, um, uh, I'm sure. But you know what? What we've uh, what we've seen is, um, of course, uh, a huge surge in uh, technologies related to uh, education and health services provision. You know, digitally, right? This is this is uh, it's it's a it's a huge phenomenon that has been happening, but. Uh, you know, whereas there's been, you know, a great demand for uh, being able to be diagnosed online or to receive education online, I think we've also learned to see all the, uh, all the deficiencies of existing solutions. Uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, I mean, I think Ilona mentioned, uh, you know, your kids, uh, you know, uh, learning online at the same time, you know, playing games or watching uh, movies. I think that you know we 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 will see uh, you know certainly an impact of the pandemic on the quality of education outcomes, and uh, there will be I think a huge push to make these systems for online learning 
uh, you know, more effective, uh, more personalized, uh, helping uh, people to overcome, you know, certain barriers in, 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 in education. Uh, and I'm sure AI will help in that as well. It is already happening. Uh, you know, we see bits and pieces, but I think it's just the beginning of a huge wave. And the same goes for, uh, you know, for uh, diagnostics um, uh, online. Uh, current systems are far from, you know, being perfect. We can do very little, uh, you know, with, with current technology. Uh, and there will be a huge demand to be able to, uh, to monitor uh, patients' health uh, remotely, to provide some, you know, at least limited assistance. We've seen great startups, for example, uh, you know, one, one example is a startup that graduated from our accelerator in Poland called Stetomy, which has pioneered research into online uh, diagnosis of, of lung, uh, you know, anomalies. Uh, respiratory an anomalies and you know big data is already proving to be more uh, effective at diagnosing certain uh, certain anomalies um, certain pathologies uh, than than uh, you know uh, uh, than some doctors so uh, there would be a good a great uh, increase uh, increase there for sure thank you pavel thomas I, I i see from your face that you are really willing to share some more insights you you have a very thoughtful face so please yeah, jump uh, in thanks <laughs> no uh, i mean uh, i i'm more the materials guy right we, we do uh, we're into the development of novel materials chemistry around that so um it's it's less covid related but what i see um uh, really uh, increasingly more often is uh, sustainability topics, bio-based materials, biodegradable materials. That is definitely on the rise right now. And it's just reflecting our reality that we, we need these kind of solutions. Uh, the second topic I think on the material side is everything around um, e-mobility. I mean, everything that goes in the next uh, generation from lightweighting materials to thermal insulation, uh, Things like that. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, Ilona, maybe you would like to, to, to add, especially knowing that you have quite an interesting portfolio in commercialization reactor and yeah, over to you. Yes, definitely. Uh, we are industry agnostic in commercialization reactors, so we see a huge variety of uh, different uh, technologies uh, being applied in different industries. Uh, I think one of the outcomes of COVID is that uh, some of the startups uh, could pivot, uh, taking into account uh, what is more important uh, nowadays. Um, I could definitely agree with Pavel that uh, health tech and med tech is now driving and all of the diagno diagnostic uh, uh, technologies are very important and uh, they should be definitely tested uh, and it takes time. Um, I can also agree with Thomas uh, about materials. Uh, we also have quite many startups uh, in advanced materials and uh, they are quite popular amongst uh, the industrial partners that we have, that they are specifically looking for, let's say, materials that improve the mechanical strengths, the durability of the materials, especially in 3D printing. This is uh, very important and we have uh, several startups <clears throat> developing these technologies. Uh, what I can also mention that uh, AI and robotics uh, is, is becoming uh, also like, like another hype uh, and uh, replacing some of, of the repetitive human work uh, in, in uh, several industries. And uh, we also have uh, several companies in our portfolio doing that. Now, but one aspect that I want to outline here is that we are working both with scientists and entrepreneurs. Uh, we see that uh, now there is a bit of a lack of uh, technologies moving forward uh, because uh, scientists just didn't have access to their labs. They didn't have an opportunity to test uh, those technologies and to do lots of R&D work. So we might experience uh, some of uh, the gap uh, in, in the technology readiness to start commercializing this. So this could be, it could be a problem at uh, some nearest future. Um, yeah. 
that that's that a very important. interesting observation and uh, i know for a fact that oftentimes commercialization of scientific breakthrough already takes quite long time so now you would anticipate even longer delays right in some cases mm -hmm. or maybe just there will be some physically out of, oh, sorry um, just because they were physically out of their facilities for for some time uh, exactly they're willing to explore yeah but this is the reality so yeah, we haven't figured out how to hack that problem just, just yet, right? Because oftentimes physical presence is also important. All right, so for now we would have, uh, from, the, from, from what you guys mentioned, we did have education, AI, robotics, and yes, I agree. I think it was even mentioned <coughs> yesterday that about 30% of uh, white and blue colors would be replaced in the nearest decade or so. So maybe next year you would uh, have not me on stage, but my chatbot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, materials and then e-mobility, health tech. Diana, I will, I will go over to you, but add a little twist to the same perspective, right? So from what I'm hearing at the moment, uh, it sounds like Everything is really good, you know, we've, we are fueling the right type of technologies, those technologies which are relevant to the circumstances we are, we are in. But uh, is it really all so, so good? Are we really fueling the right mix of technologies? Mm -hmm. Because you guys have been touching upon all the great stuff, but at the same time, as every coin, there is a, a different, a different <coughs> excuse me, side to it. So. Uh, the question would be, yes, do we, do we really choose to, to fuel the right mix of technologies? And the context for this question is, is, is pretty straightforward. As you guys mentioned, at the moment, right, we look at education. Uh, digital education makes it possible to carry through the pandemic or whatever it is. So I do have trust in that. The, f the financial technologies allow to bank the unbanked and, you know, now we have a lot of solutions for sustainability, wonderful things. And uh, we see that technologies even allow uh, for revolutions to happen, like recently in Belarus, the Telegram-driven revolution, right, and whatnot, and Wall Street versus Reddit, uh, the whole crisis, which I personally found very, very amusing. But at the same time, uh, technologies do give us this platform for violence, uh, digital violence, for abuse, for racism, the hashtag Black Lives Matter, what we saw recently, the old turbulence around Trump uh, leaving the office and how the digital, you know, environment made quite a big, big trouble out of it. So, yeah, now the question is we as, as, as humanity, have we been doing good in that, in that sense? Okay. It's, a, it's a bit tricky question, but yeah, Diana, I, I also know you do have a lot of background in this social aspect, mm -hmm. right? So how would you evaluate this? Yeah, so I have a job to answer a question on behalf of humanity. So if someone doesn't agree with me, <laughs> I'm happy to, <laughs> happy to discuss. But uh, let me bring my view in the perspective. So I think what we're coming to realize is that behind technology, there's still this human factor in it. And as investors, I think on my behalf, that's a part of the due diligence that you do. You want to invest in founders, in founding teams who are building the future you believe in. And I think it's kind of very evident throughout this past year is that, of course, technologies drive societal progress, but behind these technologies, there are still people who are designing them. So we as investors and we as consumers have to vote with our wallet. What are the technologies we want to kind of back with our investments, with our consumer the purchase decisions? I think that's one very important element that kind of still is very prevalent because without us, the investors and the consumers, the people who invest money and time in certain solutions, there won't be these products that might not be good or bad uh, for that matter. So that's one kind of element to it. I think that's very important. The second, um, I think that maybe coming back to the last question, but what's changed during the past uh, year is that, of course, a lot of um, technologies were accelerated, but I think what really changed is the technology adoption. 
we saw people who never use technology being so savvy on Zoom <laughs> like never before. And this is what really drove the progress over the past few past, past year. Because EdTech has been here for like, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years. It's been a hot topic forever. But COVID accelerated these technologies. And I think it's important to look at this human prism in all of these discussions is that humans still drive all the adoption in the technology. And as long as these humans have the values that the kind of thought around it. I think this is the way how we can kind of get to the future we want to be. So I'm a, I, maybe I'm an optimist, but I think there's a lot of ground to believe in to that we actually can matter collectively uh, when we kind of choose which technologies to drive forward. Right, wonderful. I really like how you bring the humanity factor into, into this equation because at the end of the day, you're absolutely right, in my opinion. It, it's, it's all about people, right? And it's all for people, or at least that's how it should be. Uh, guys, any, any violent reactions to, to what we've been doing now, bringing this uh, yeah, human factor in, in technologies and talking about what's been good, what's been not so good? Um, anything which maybe you know disturbs you personally in 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 what you see in the in the in the current mix of technologies we've been fueling and perhaps will continue f fueling in the future. I will not address this question to any of you. Yes, Thomas, please go ahead. If if I may, I mean I I mentioned sustainability as as a topic, and we see I mean also in our company. Every project has a sustainability goal, something that is going to make the world at least a little bit better. But what we're lacking is the, the big picture in terms of how do we come to a real sustainable future? And that has to be with using our raw materials in a circular way, not in a linear way as before, but in a circular way, reusing them things as a principle. And the inherent um, challenge in that is that you have players along the value chain that all make money right now. Now, if you have one party developing something great, then usually the, the horizon for that is it's with your supplier or with your customer. But it's not considering basically how to, to get that linear value chain into a loop. For that kind of thinking, we really need, I mean, I'm, it's, it's a space tech stage, so a bit, a bit of vision. We really need to, to break down that value-added contributions from each of those players and envision together, and now not only with your supplier and your customers, but with everyone along that value chain, how that can be a circular value chain in the future. And this means giving up positions. I mean, convince a company CEO that he has to give up on something. That's a, a, a really a problem. But this is the kind of thinking that has to start right now, and is it is starting already. How, how can we make those value chains circular? And I think we're just at the beginning to realize that it, it won't happen overnight. It won't happen without all of our support. It won't happen without governmental support and regulations. But this has to happen. Thank you, Thomas. Pavel, I would like maybe you to, to, to comment further if you would like to touch upon topic yes, of sustainability I, or, mm -hmm. yeah, please, over to I'm you. In, I'm, in violent, I'm in violent agreement with, with, my, uh, with the previous speakers. Uh, so um, let me make two comments. So the first one is that um, if you look at the whole situation with the pandemic, you know, it's an excellent example of... Um, of how we need to uh, very quickly get good at solving problems that we have caused in the first place as humanity, right? Because uh, in, not just this pandemic, but also previous outbreaks of Ebola and uh, the swine flu um, were basically caused by uncontrolled expansion of, of humans and interference with the natural habitats of, of, of wild animals. That's how these pathogens uh, were transferred to human habitats. So now we have to be very creative and start solving problems that we created in the first place. And, uh, you know, the same goes for a lot of the clean tech uh, area, right? Uh, where we are basically dealing with our own uh, limited imagination and uh, 
and the wrongdoings in the past. So I do agree that uh, uh, I do agree that uh, we have to look at uh, we have to look at the, the moral aspect of, of investments, the so-called moral capital that is often overlooked uh, by by VCs. Uh, and and other investors, you know, in search of profits. I think that uh, we we do have to. Uh, I agree with Diana. We have to look at uh, the ethical standards of uh, of startups and the founders, um, and support those uh, who will do good with the, with the technology. Because almost any technology can be used either for good or for bad. Uh, you look at blockchain. It is used to instill trust in digital networks. But bitcoins are typically used also, I mean, frequently also used uh, for money laundering. Um, internet can be a force for good, like you mentioned with the Telegram revolution, but, uh, you know, it's also used to spread uh, fake news and misinformation. Um, the, the area that I'm most concerned about is related to artificial intelligence uh, and also perhaps, you know, gene editing um, these are areas that are extremely uh, sensitive. Uh, you know, AI is probably the strongest technology we've ever dealt with as humanity. And you know, it was actually in the 50s when uh, John von Neumann and Stanisław Ulam, you know, discussed this concept of uh, technology singularity. Uh, you know, as a moment in, in the you know perhaps distant future, maybe now not so distant future, when you know technology will cease to be controllable by humans anymore. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I don't think we can fully control development of AI. And uh, there are, simply speaking, you know, bad people out there with bad intentions uh, who will uh, you know work with with, uh, with you know to 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 use this technology. To the detriment of, of 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 humans. That's that's what I'm worried about, um, and I think that's something that we definitely have to look at uh, and you know think about the implications, but also you know the possible precautions that we can take. So you know uh, to sum up, uh, you know Einstein once you know famously said that imagination is more important than knowledge. I think we we tend to get very excited about the new knowledge being developed. Uh, in new ideas, you know, the, the outbursts of human creativity. Uh, but we forget that we, we don't spend enough time imagining, you know, how that technology, how that new knowledge can be applied, you know, the positive and negative outcomes. And then we are surprised um, by what happens. We have to change that paradigm, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. So circular value chains, right? Uh, sustainability, moral aspects and capital. I'm just summarizing and that on the good side and that's what we should be striving for. And then at the part where things worry and disturb us, we have AI, gene editing, uh, added uh, by, by Pavel. Ilona, what worries you looking into the future? What disturbs you? What, what, what do you think might go off the rails and and uh, undermine the humanity maybe even <laughs> since we talk about that as well well i do believe that it's always uh, about people not just about technologies and i do agree with diana uh, the thing that i want to bring to the discussion is that the timing of the investments and also the cooperation between all the all of the parties involved because we understand that startups uh, developing uh, their business uh, they uh, use different types of funding they start using more grants at the r d phase then they need uh, industrial pilots to test their technology then uh, let's say a deep tech focus investor comes into play then there is a vc and uh, it's really important that uh, they do cooperate with each other, that they talk to each other. Uh, because uh, when you, let's say, support the technology that uh, no one's need, yeah, and you do lots of R&D, and you do not talk to the industry so much, then you might, might be wasting lots of uh, time and money. And uh, let's say if a corporate VC uh, doesn't want to interact with a startup and or they may be uh, very much risk averse maybe they are missing something and the technology is not there at the time that is needed so i think these are aspects also very important but these players they, they also need to talk to each other in terms of uh, 
what would be the outcome of uh, the adoption of that or this technology. So it's not just uh, it's not just about timing, but also about the outcome. So these are two aspects to add. Right. To the discussion. So cooperation and timing added to the mix. But I would like still to go back a little bit to what we were raising and perhaps not naming it yet. And I will give it a name. I think we talked a lot in one way or another already about, about impact, actually, right? So this is a word which was used quite a lot yesterday. And um, I'm really happy to actually see that. We talk about sustainability and we define sustainability. Uh, and we talk about if the technologies are meaningful or they just, you know, add marginal utility to us as a society. So impact, right? I want to really touch upon that to continue the logic of, 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 of this conversation and this eternal battle, which you also touched upon, guys, you know, doing good and making money. Profit versus impact. And unfortunately, still, at least the way I see it, there is a big versus, not hand in hand, not profit uh, along with, with, with impact, but still, I think impact is quite a big underdog in this, in this battle. And um, it's a buzzword. Many people do use it. Do they mean it? Mm, sometimes I'm really doubtful about that. So would you agree to that, that, that this battle at the moment is being still won by profit. And you know what? I'm, re I'm really happy I can be asking you about this because the four of you, in one way or another, uh, represent money. As, as Diana mentioned, uh, you know, the, the wallets which, which vote because you guys come either from VC, acceleration space, or also big, big, big corporate. So, in a way, I do hold people like you. Um, responsible in a way for choosing the right technologies to back, right? The right technologies to invest into. Because you can not only fuel them in a very abstract way, but you can literally fuel them, right? So guys, yes, please, your, your, your insights on, on impact, is it a part of your professional equation? I'm sure it is part of your personal equation. I can, I can see that it transpires. And if yes, please elaborate. How do you even measure impact? It's such an amorphous thing. It's such an abstract thing in a way, right? Profit is easy. How many zeros after, after the comma and things like that? But yeah, Diana, I will, I will go back to you again mm -hmm. okay. to transition further All right. into this discussion. Yeah, I think it's, it's a very act, like topical question. I think impact is everywhere now. I think it's kind of even crossing the green washing, green washing uh, kind of line that uh, people have, agno have acknowledged that this is a very good PR message, that whatever you do has to have some green angle to it, and maybe people will kind of be more interested in your product. So I think there's a very thin line with doing good and like marketing it well. <laughs> so I think that that's kind of distinction we have to make. And when we have uh, could kind of go back to the investment end, I think we are being pressured into the impact angle by numerous forces. One is the consumer force. I think the kind of the younger generation coming into the equation, the Gen Zs or whatever you call them, they are more kind of willing to look at the impact angle in anything. And uh, I was just participating yesterday in a Gen Z discussion about what are their values as a kind of as a as a species, no, but as, as a generation and impact was one of the top things. So but please remind me, Gen Z, we're referring to to, which to the young ages? people. Yeah, but like, <laughs> am I in, in 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 Gen Z or there are so many Gen, so I'm not sure. I'm, I, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but most probably <laughs> we are on the millennial end of things. But uh, <laughs> anyway, that's kind of one, one part of, 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 uh, of, of the discussion is that younger people kind of care, as always they do, uh, the young people are, are more rebellious and they want to hold the companies and kind of everyone accountable, uh, as we've seen with, with uh, Greta Thunberg and, and other kind of young voices speaking up about climate change and, and other kind of impact things. So that's one thing. Second is that I think we have, we have kind of regulatory pressure coming in with ESG reporting becoming a norm in the very soon future for companies, for VC funds. It just becomes inevitable that we need to, me to measure our carbon 
carbon footprint that we need to measure our impact as a company, as an investment fund, and definitely for Super Angel, impact is a part of our equation. We are heavily invested in, in emissionless uh, uh, mobility, actually. We've, been, we've backed uh, a few carbon neutral companies, we've backed a few uh, new mobility companies. Bolt is one example. We also have backed other, other kind of mobility uh, companies in this space. So we definitely take into account when making the investment decisions. Because again, coming back to the uh, kind of initial point that we need to be uh, voting for the technologies we believe in. And I think this is not just talking the talk, this is walking the, uh, walking the talk. So this is what I urge everyone. And I believe that this panel uh, is, is on the same page with, with this narrative as well. Thomas, I will, I will ambush you. So, um, future and impact. Does impact has future? <laughs> uh, and uh, how do you approach this, this aspect? Yeah, I, I mean, impact for, for me has to be, uh, there has to be a quantifiable dimension behind it. So, uh, I, I do see the point that some companies use that as a marketing gimmick as well, but um, I, I think it has to be much more. It has to be a quantified dimension behind it. So, for example, for, for our company, it's, it's really already in the DNA to have every project and are add a uh, sustainability dimension to it. We have commitments to basically become carbon neutral in our uh, energy consumption, which we already achieved for our production energy, but we will also off that the, uh, CO2 uh, balance for any other energy we consume until I think the commitment is to 2025. Well, as a, there's a lot of investment in renewable enemy, uh, uh, energies to, to basically uh, get to the uh, resource. But that's just one thing, the, the energy balance. Um, as said, um, I think we, we have to come from a sustainability thinking where there's clear cut dimensions. I, economy uh, economy is, is, is one of that. I mean, if you sell the same stuff uh, uh, or, or half of the, the amount at uh, a better price with the same kind of uh, uh, specs, so you're doing still the trick, then also this is sustainability. But um, the environmental, the social dimensions, we, we can try to quantify, but again, I think we have to come to that circular loop that we reuse materials more. And I firmly believe that there's no contradiction in terms to combine impact and profit. Just one example. So we're developing additives that um, help recycle plastic. So recycling in a, in a circular way means you can, after the use of a material, you can take that same uh, uh, material as the raw material in the same kind of value of the application. Often, right now, it's a downcycling that you can't reach the quality of the material that, uh, that yeah, I mean, the, the most prominent example is that black flower pot you buy in a DIY store. Yes, you can re re uh, recycle every plastic into that black uh, plastic flower pot, but that's not the solution. The solution is really to come more and more to circular use of materials. And I think this is the biggest impact uh, uh, on, from the material side that can be reached. And I surely hope that there's profit in it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Thomas. Ilona, Pavel, your comments about impact and I'm, you know, I'm like still fishing from, for, for, for very tangible, so to say, way of measuring impact, right? So Ilona, maybe, maybe uh, a question at you. So commercialization reactor, um, again, the same question remains, right? If impact is the part of, of this equation, but uh, how do you approach it? Is it in your due diligence list? Like, how do you, how do you anticipate for the right impact uh, which technology maybe brings on the table? Because, you know, oftentimes there are promises made, but not really delivered. I mean, and you just know the right things to say, right? But, but uh, delivery is a, a, a whole different story. So impact and commercialization reactor, how, how do you guys do that? Uh, well, definitely we do discuss uh, what impact each technology has uh, on the society, on the global challenges uh, that we are all uh, trying to, to face and solve. 
uh, what we discuss with uh, startups usually, and this is part of the acceleration program, is the features of the technology. And uh, it's always the list of specific uh, uh, things that are associated with this technology and what do they mean for the society, for businesses, for people. And uh, we usually try to ask entrepreneurs to quantify it. And one of the aspects is uh, be it uh, environmental footprint or let's say making something uh, cheaper, better, uh, faster, Let's say we have um, a startup uh, that has a technology to produce uh, 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 bigger surface zinc oxide and adding uh, this zinc oxide <clears throat> into the tires. Uh, uh, the producers of tires can use less zinc oxide, which means uh, uh, footprint, footprint uh, for, uh, for us all is, is less. I mean, the environmental footprint is better. So, and uh, it's, it's just one example, but we usually uh, try to actually also educate those who go through our acceleration program that it's not just profits. Uh, these are all other aspects that brings uh, this or that technology. Right. Pavel, how do you do that at the Value Tax Seed Fund? Again, impact. Part of equation, not, and to what Absolutely. extent, and how Absolutely. do you measure? Absolutely, we. Um, it's very much part of our due diligence. Uh, we uh, uh, we inquire about uh, you know the potential social environmental impacts of of the technology that uh, uh, that startups are developing before we make any investments. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, I'm quite positive uh, about uh, how you know impact investing is seems to be growing um, I think uh, you know we we of course need need uh, let's say more recognition of that um, but uh, you know that there is good institutional uh, incentives being introduced globally uh, like carbon tax uh, to, to speed up adoption of uh, of sustainable technologies. I think you know we see a growing interest in triple uh, bottom line reporting for for you know for companies. Uh, it's not you know advancing as fast as we would like, uh, I suppose, but it is it is happening. So uh, I'm actually quite quite positive about uh, how these things are are going. And you know the greater transparency that is provided by internet um, also uh, means that uh, you know companies that uh, do you know bad practices either internally or externally. Uh, you know, treating their suppliers badly or, you know, using um, uh, using child workforce, you know, are going to be exposed very quickly and uh, and the price they have to pay, uh, uh, e even in economic, purely economic terms, is often uh, quite, uh, quite high. So um, this is a positive, uh, positive outcome of, uh, of technology, I guess. Thank Can I bring you. a bit of criticism in the yeah, discussion? Sure. <laughs> yeah, so I think what's, um, what strikes me, and I agree with everything that, that has been said, but uh, what me bu like bugs me personally is that we are quite getting quite good at measuring things, but we still haven't figured out what to do about it. Basically, there are a lot of kind of carbon footprint uh, measuring tools and startups and ideas, but we still haven't figured out. So, okay, we have measured our uh, footprint, but what should we do about it? And I think that's where the innovation will come in. Um, I don't necessarily believe that planting trees will be the answer to everything, right? We can't really just plant trees forever and hope, <laughs> cross our fingers and hope for the best. So I think that's a very important thing to take into account when investing, when evaluating companies and so on is actually one side of the coin is measuring and saying that yes we are compliant with this regulation or uh, our carbon footprint is this zero or whatnot but the other question is really what can we do about it not to meet the bare minimum but actually exceed that and do something for good and that's where a lot of innovation is still is still uh, is going to be there so that's just the point i wanted to throw in here yeah, uh, funny thing you mentioned it, uh, measuring but not perhaps being able to act on it or not knowing what exactly we measured here, what are those numbers uh, used for, right? Um, another example would be the very happiness index. Uh, not sure, guys, you, you follow that kind of indices, <laughs> I do. Um, and um, it's, it's quite amusing how at the time when we learned 
in a way to measure happiness. Another philosophical question, how do you measure that? But, but you know, there are some, some tools. At the moment, we realized how to measure happiness. The, the average uh, happiness level dropped significantly. I'm not sure what it really uh, tells us, uh, but I found this, this uh, perhaps not a coincidence. Uh, Pavel, you mentioned impact investing, and um, I would like to throw a question up for grabs for you guys. So explain to me, what is impact investing, but in a very simple term, if possible, uh, and um, how exactly that happens? Um, impact investments, do you do the, I don't know, again, remember, profit, impact, how do we factor those two in the in the in this in this equation and uh, do we do the weighted average of profit and impact uh, if if we do the weighted average what are the weights so yeah please impact investment what is that everybody talks about that yeah well Let me say, uh, let, let me start with, by saying that I I, uh, I look at it much more broadly than just uh, uh, just through measurements. Uh, you know, as I think Peter Drucker famously said, not not everything that we measure matters, and not everything that matters can be measured. And I think impact is one of those intangible things also um, that is very hard to grasp. But for me, it's uh, much more about uh, than you know about counting you know weighted averages. Um, for for a VC investor that I am, you know, in, impact investing starts actually when you build start building a fund. Uh, it's by developing a thesis that stresses the sustainability as an important component. It's by attracting investors into your fund that have an appreciation for that, who share your your perspective. It's by managing uh, the VC firm in a way that is uh, sustainable, that is respectful, uh, both internally to you know VC firm employees, but also uh, supportive, uh, constructive uh, to portfolio companies. So that's um, and of course it's about you know investment criteria, um, but it's a much broader it's a much broader thing for me. Right, but then. Again, the question for for Powell and 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 all of you, what Pavel was was mentioning that you know, of course, impact is so hard to measure. So uh, we resort to appreciation of you know startups and partners who have you know shared values with us, things like that. But is it is it really like enough? Like how much appreciation is enough to make sure you want to work with them? Um, do we really just rely on our gut feeling? Um, don't you think it's quite easy then to to make a false impression and again, while labeling ourselves and the activities as very uh, sustainable and impact oriented, uh, actually do the opposite thing? So is gut feeling enough? I'm just having a question. You know, I have a doubt rather if impact is not some kind of in institutionalized thing or I don't know measured thing, then perhaps we will just uh, fall short on on capturing it in a proper way. Any let, volunteers? Let me, just, uh, the, yeah. let me let me just throw in just one more comment, uh, and then then I'll shut up. Uh, so I think you know impact cannot be uh, just uh, limited to uh, environmental uh, environmental measurements, right? It, 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 once you start doing it, and once you only look at you know carbon footprint, which you know which is a hugely important measure in, in the situation we are in, but if you just limit your your you know your your perspective to this, then very soon you will end up in a situation where impact is about what other people are doing. We all have impact on, you know, on the quality of life of people we are working with, our families, uh, our employees, uh, as an investor on the quality of, of, uh, of management of portfolio companies. This is uh, also an area of impact. And it, it can be, uh, you know, it can be measured, uh, you know, more or less precisely. Sometimes, you know, certain things are intangible. But I think it's much more about philosophy uh, of investing. Than about uh, you know one or two metrics. Uh, it, we we have to start measuring impact with our with ourselves and you know 
think every day, what is going to be my positive impact today? Uh, so that, that's how I, I look at it. Any more comments? Yes, Silona? Also continue. Well, uh, yeah, if we go deeply philosophically, we do things and we impact uh, everyone else around uh, with our activities. And uh, I think everyone should define what is the focus of that impact, be it environmental or anything else, be it security or privacy. And uh, then going into this focus, I think it is important to have uh, very different angles and very different views. And I go back to my idea of cooperation of different partners in the ecosystem. You need to understand the uh, uh, different way of thinking of each one involved. Because if you, if you are the only one making this decision, uh, then you might be wrong. And it's in human nature to, to make mistakes. It's, it's really normal. So I think uh, it's also our responsibility to understand different viewpoints and also the, uh, and, uh, the, the, the impact that we are having uh, with our decision, having only single uh, view uh, might, be, might be really negative. Yeah, so I think that's, that's, that's the aspect that, that is very important to keep in mind. Thank you, Ilona. I'm glad you're mentioning it. And in the in this age, uh, when we have you know abundance of information and uh, lack of attention, I think communication is becoming even 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 harder. There are so many tools to communicate, uh, especially now all across the world. The world is small, you know. The world sleeps under the same blanket by 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 now, and yet we fail to actually have meaningful communication. Uh, often, oftentimes uh, across countries, across different stakeholders within the country. Here in Latvia, we are quite sinful of that. Uh, a small country, but uh, a few stakeholders, including the government and whatnot, right? Uh, the the non-government sector, private, corporate. So yeah, it's 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 quite a challenge. And I remember a year ago, I was I was uh, part of the panel at, at at the Deep Tech Atelier Riga. 2020, it means, no, 20, it was cancelled last year, no, it wasn't, <laughs> sorry, the COVID uh, has messed my, my memory, but it was, yes, another remote setup, and we were talking exactly about that, how stakeholders do not communicate despite all tools being available to them. Guys, as we will have to wrap up uh, this, this discussion pretty soon, I would like, um, you know, to run a little shock therapy for, for you. I would like to pull out your crystal balls now, since we are talking about the future, and put those on the table. And um, I would like to invite you to bet, to bet if you had all the money of the world, or your life maybe, well, no, I will not take your life, but to place a bet on one technology or tech sector. Okay, we don't have to be so specific. Uh, which tomorrow will allow us to survive and thrive. What would it be? Be as futuristic as you like, you know, no strings attached and uh, it's non-binding. <laughs> you don't have to promise me that. But yes, your bet, what would that be? Thomas, I will start with you maybe. Uh, obviously, my bet is on advanced materials. I mean, I, I'm, I'm betting since a couple of years now. <laughs> <laughs> so if anything can change how, how we produce energy, how we uh, get things in a, uh, in a circular economy kind of fashion, then advanced materials will play a crucial role there. Right. Diana, back at you. Hmm. Yeah, difficult to name one. Uh, I mean, as mentioned, I think, I think, like, I don't bet on one technology for a reason because I think it's because investors diversify. <laughs> exactly. But so, yeah. <laughs> so you're kind of uh, yeah giving me the taste of my own medicine, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think everything that's around education and remote work is here to stay. So I mean, this is something we're living through now. The the kind of the deliveries, the 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 educa remote education, remote work. These are the areas that are going to stay after COVID with us. So yeah, better embrace them and take most out of them. I'd say. Ilona? Well, what also was your bet? Question for me, yes, because diversification is also my motto. <laughs> but uh, if I would bet uh, to one technology, that would be very um, 
difficult bat, uh, gene sequencing, gene engineering, and well, also very uh, has a different side of, of the coin, but still, I think that would be the one. Okay, something Pavel is, is quite disturbed by, right? Gene engineering and, and sequencing. Okay, oh, so Pavel... Yeah, like, you know, it, it's going to be very positive, of course, uh, but uh, there are risks uh, attached to this technology, of course, as well. Yeah, the, you're so, right, because technology can be like a hammer, right? You can use it to put a nail in yeah. the wall or smash someone's head. It's, exactly. it's, a, it's a tool. <laughs> but yes, what's your bet? Okay, so short-term hydrogen, uh, mid-term uh, quantum... Uh, quantum technologies and long-term time travel. <laughs> That's a super clear answer. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that. I hope in 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 a year from now we will be, you know, uh, here in Riga, hopefully enjoying each other faces in physical environment and having some some nice conversation about that. And to, and and we will see if 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 uh, our bets. Well, I haven't placed any bet. Very, very <laughs> convenient for me. Yeah, but if your bets have actually come come true, uh, I am now trying to check if we have any uh, questions from the audience because I would like to give that opportunity to to the audience to address. I do think people get carried away with uh, all the philosophy and and uh, you know impact of our conversation on them made them quite silent so i don't think we have any 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 questions uh, at the moment so well we'll will with with that said i would like to yeah thank you thank you for this discussion if you have any last comments or violent reactions as i call them please it's 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 time to voice them Anyone? Yes, Thomas. Yeah, one, one last comment. Uh, Pablo mentioned optimism. Uh, that's, I think, the, the, the right thing to do. And I just remembered, because I've uh, read an article recently, a German philosopher saying, we need to double down on courage and on knowledge. Then we will come over the future and not the future over us. And I think th this is something uh, you don't have to place your bet on one technology. It's just we have to do something and be courageous. Thank you. That's really beautifully put. And um, yes, that's that's the tomorrow I would wish for, actually. And uh, to 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 wrap this discussion, um, let's just yeah not forget that what we fuel today will become our tomorrow. So let's be smart about it, thoughtful, and. Uh, let's be actually also impact oriented. I do hope. I do hope that one day. There will be equality sign between profit and impact. They both can exist and coexist and make each other even happier. So I do thank you for your time. And I hope to see you one day here in Riga. Thomas and Pavel, Ilona and Diana, thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. That's a thank wrap. You. Thank, thank you. you very much.